We're here today to talk about some of the challenges facing families without homes. I want to start with a snapshot of the situation as it stands right now. First Place Family Center is first of all a day shelter for open every day of the year. First Place helps over 500 families, 800 to 1,000 children every year. The majority of them have no place to live when they walk through our door. The rest are experiencing a crisis that puts them at high risk of homelessness. We're also able to house 10 families at a time through our Interfaith Night Shelter program and another 14 families who have a vehicle they can sleep in at night through our overnight parking program. All of the local agencies serving families with children have experienced severe cuts in funding. Individuals and businesses are less able to donate and the depressed economy has forced major cuts in government funding. For example, reduced funding caused Catholic Community Services to close their nine emergency housing units for families. And Shelter Care, who operated 37 family housing units a decade ago, is now down to nine. First Place was forced to close our free preschool that provide child care for families who are newly employed. The number of staff at First Place helping the 500 plus families is down to three in the daytime and one taking care of the night shelter program after hours. And we've got one person who works from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. on weekends. Every day we receive phone calls from families with kids who have no place to sleep at night. Our night shelter program has 25 families on the waiting list. St. Vincent de Paul, who's built over a thousand units of affordable housing, has a year's waiting list. One thing I'll say about the local social services network, we all work closely with each other, trying to mitigate the impact of these cuts on families and children. What I want to touch on today is, who are these parents who can't take care of their children? What comes to mind when we think about them? I'm going to pose some questions. We don't have time to get your responses right now, but perhaps may, you may want to touch on them during your table discussions. What comes to mind when you hear, did you see that homeless guy with a sign on the street corner? What image comes up? Any feelings? Any judgments? Is there anyone to blame? Is it different if I say, I saw a homeless dad with three little girls holding a sign on my way here today. Who do we blame for this? What, if anything, should be done about it? More close to home, what, if anything, should we do about it? There's a lot of political talk about whether people are entitled to health care, food, and housing. For many years, the answer was yes, at least for families with children. Aid to families with dependent children, AFDC, was an entitlement program. Now we have temporary aid to needy families, or TANF, temporary being the key word. TANF is limited to five years, 60 months, in a person's lifetime. TANF for a family of three is $506 a month. That's 11% of our local median income and less than one-third of what's considered to be in poverty. There was an attempt in Oregon last year to reduce lifetime TANF benefits to 18 months and also cut the grant amount. It didn't pass, but expect it back as part of the next biennium. One of the main barriers to finding solutions is the automatic negative judgment so many of us have when we see someone in need. What did they do wrong? Why don't they find a job? Why should we help them? A lot of our judgments are a carryover from our frontier heritage, the pioneer, the rugged individualist, the lone ranger. These stereotypes don't serve us well anymore. We live in a complex society where no one's accomplishments are wholly their own. We're influenced by our parents, teachers, neighbors, mentors, and friends. Even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. One interesting thing about being unable to care for your family in America is that we have a deficit model of poverty. If you're having financial trouble, if you're one of the one in six people below the poverty line, it's because there's something wrong with you. It's your fault. People with financial difficulties internalize the negative judgments of society and fail to take into consideration the larger forces at work in our economy. We see a lot of veterans at first place. We recently had a proud veteran at first place tell me that walking through our door and asking for help was harder than anything he experienced as a Navy SEAL. The shame of not being able to provide for your family is often overwhelming. The biggest difference between someone in a third world country living in poverty and someone experiencing poverty in America is that in the third world, they know it's not their fault that they're poor. They understand that they're in a system that makes it hard to break out and succeed. They know it's not all about them. What I've been able to observe from working with first place families is that they're like everyone else. They want a better life for their children. They want meaningful work. They want to feel good about themselves. 
Mostly what brings people to first place is the result of things like the changes in the economy, the changes in the job market, or, or untreated physical and mental illnesses and domestic violence. There are immense barriers to finding work and housing, again becoming a contributing member of our society. Some companies won't hire anyone who isn't already employed. Even if you've paid your rent on time your whole life, if you're evicted, most landlords won't rent to you. Resources for going to school and gaining new skills are shrinking. If we're going to find the will and resources to stabilize and empower families, we need to stop seeing people through the lens of negative judgments and stereotypes begin to see who they really are. They're our neighbors, people who worked and contributed to our community. Their children are part of our future. In short, they're part of us. I want to end by suggesting one small but powerful change in our thought and language. It's called person-centered language. A person is more than their circumstances. If you have diabetes, you're not a diabetic. You're a person with a condition called diabetes. You're so much more than your illness. Someone is not an alcoholic, they're a person with an addiction to alcohol. My stepson Michael isn't a schizophrenic, he's a person with schizophrenia. Our families at first place are not homeless. They're families in transition. They had a place to live before, they'll be housed again. Right now they're a family with no safe place to sleep at night. It dehumanizes both us and them to think of them as only the homeless. People are much more than their current condition. There are no easy answers, but together we can find ways to restore needed services and develop creative ways to help these families, these children, to experience the American dream. Next, Deborah Daly will talk about her work with school-aged children who have no stable place to live. It can become particularly difficult for these kids. How do you do homework if you have no home? How do you belong when you can never invite anyone over? Thank you. <laughs>